many times when people have said that the fish are inactive, and they say generally what you want to do is slow down. Realistically, throughout a good portion of the year, particularly in the summer and the fall, the reverse. You want to go faster. Uh, trigger faster, more reactionary strikes. And that's something that a lot of walleye anglers have really never dealt with. And we've used it a lot in musky fishing and bass fishing and understanding that you look at a walleye, you can see that this thing is a carnivore. You can, it's got big teeth. This fish cruises through the water column and is an aggressive predator that eats up and down all over. It does. You know what I mean? And this isn't something that you have to go in there and drag a live bait rig and a leech or a big chunk to sit there and you know, tempt them in and strike them. That isn't what you have to do all the time. A high speed reactive triggering presentation can be far and away more, more effective and faster than these slow presentations. That's one thing about it. it, it one thing about these chase baits or these horizontal baits, it enables you to cover more water quicker. Um, this is something uh, I'm just going to talk about is uh, drop speed is critical in any jig fishing situation. And this is something that uh, we were stating earlier, and we carry a wide range of jigs. How many, everybody carries, has a big pile of jigs in their tackle boxes. And the thing is, is the willingness for you to experiment with these baits and the way you can fish them. Most people, when they pick up a jig, they take it and they throw it out and they let it sink right down to the bottom. That's the way you fish a jig. That isn't the way you fish a jig. Good jig fishermen don't fish that way. Good jig fishermen do this. They fish, they're fishing, number one, I'm fishing really slow drop speed with a 16th or an eighth ounce jig. I'm gonna put a little piece of soft plastic or a live bait on there and they throw it up on those uh, pea gravel points or the shale points and you get a, you know, it's got the slower drop speed if they're really inactive. At certain times, if the fish are spawning, certain times, bottom drag. You take the bait, you throw it out, let it sink down to the bottom, and I'm not gonna jig the bait, I'm gonna drag it right on the bottom. And you will catch more fish by doing that. And there's a dramatic difference between the slow drop speed, the bottom drag, or a slow swim. If the fish, sometimes you don't even want the bait on the bottom, if the bait is just hovering and moving along at a real slow uh, uh, speed. And sometimes one of the best presentations, which I'm going to talk to a little bit more in depth to, in, in depth to, with, is fast. Using fishing baits really fast in the rack and shallow water. And it is absolutely mind-boggling on how many fish you can catch doing this. Uh, snap wrap is the bait that Chris went in depth on. This is one of Al Winder's absolute favorite techniques over the last like four years, everybody has snap. How many people have fished jig jigging wraps and snap wraps in deep water in, a, in an open water situation? One of you guys go buy, buy jigging wraps. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. <laughs> because it, it's an amazing tool that it, it, it gives you the ability and it goes to this trigger response. What you're doing is triggering a, a a reactionary response from the walleye in a wide depth of different situations. And I have it to casting or slow trolling from 10 to 50 foot of, or 10 to 50 foot of water retreat with a quick snap off the bottom. The interesting thing is once you get used to fishing this bait, I'm going to take it and make a short pitch and I'm about halfway in the center of the audience. I'm casting into 10 foot of water and I'm holding the boat to 30 foot of water. I'm going to take it and flip the bait out, let it sink down to the bottom, pop it off the bottom, let it fall back down top it off the bottom, let it fall back down. It's very, very heavy. Some of these baits weigh between a half and three, three eight, or seven eighths of an ounce. So it covers the water incredibly quickly. It gives you the ability to cover this huge, huge uh, depth of water vertically very quick. And it's not only on a real sharp drop, wall drop like this, it could be on a uh, really deep flats. It could be, deep flats is actually where it's real strength is. But the thing is, it's, we're fishing on a spinning rod, 10 to 12, 10 pound test line, barrel swivel and slightly above it. Now, I got a shot of, of the, here, we were fishing, it was like a, a barrel swivel about 10 inches above this. Monofilament line, preferably mono. You can use braid, but one thing you'll notice about this, you'll have a tendency to lose fish if you use braid or leak out a lot because it's with these hooks in there for some reason. I, I don't know what it is, but monofilament works the best for this. And you know, a six and a half foot spinning rod. But the way you're fishing it, what's really interesting is the way these fish hit the bait. How they're hitting it, they're picking it up off the bottom. You can snap the bait off the bottom, you're gonna drop it back down, and you can next time you lift up, the fish is on. 
You understand what I mean? It's not most of the time when fish hit jigs or fit hitting it when it's falling. You know, it's at the top of the fall and it's falling back down like this. This is different, and there's a couple of different ways to do it. We cast it and fish it really snapping erratically back to the boat, or we'll sit there and move along at about maybe one mile an hour at just enough speed to keep bottom contact. And what's really critical, you want the bait pounding and bouncing off the bottom. When you're flipping it up off the bottom, let it fall back down. Flipping it up off the bottom, let it fall back down. Now, do, where are you going to say that we're going to fish this bait? You see, this, this is a deep point here, and this point is anywhere from 15 to 30 foot of water. I don't have depth contours on here, and there's a specific reason, because I don't want to say just this depth. It's not. This is the, the concept of you have to apply it to the water you fish, of where this will work. The same thing up on these big, uh, big expanse of flats. This is a big point. This is a quarter of a mile area. One thing that's really critical about this is your ability to cover a tremendous amount of water really, really quickly. With this casting retrieve, you're moving <coughs> along at a pretty fast pace. pace. You're moving along this fast with the trolling motor, flipping it up, letting it sink to the bottom, and you just snap it like this. Let it fall back to the bottom. Let it fall back to the bottom. The interesting thing is about this technique, do you know how many different species of fish we've caught on it? Wildlife's probably smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, catfish, everything bites on this. And that's when you know it's, it's a winner. You know what I mean? A lot of different species of fish bite on this presentation. This is one where we've used it a lot. If this is, I've got a quarter, a three eighths ounce head. This is a, a BMC hot skirts jig with a soft plastic <coughs> tail on it. What we do with this is fish, this is the exact opposite spectrum of the snap jigging in deeper water from 15 to 50. We're doing this exact thing from 10 foot up to four foot in the mean beds. In our northern natural lakes throughout the summer in our area, nobody fishes mean beds for walleyes. We were talking earlier, the biggest food shelves in the lake are these big underwater flats, whether it be rocks, weed beds, big underwater points. That's where the food is at, that's where the predators are at. Walleyes love weed beds, and what we'll do is take a 3 8 ounce head with this thing, and the same thing, and you're going to get up in four to five foot of water over weed beds, and you'll notice one thing that's really critical about this is this head weight. It's got to be heavy. If you fish a moderate to, slow, to lighter head, it will not work half as well as the heavier bait will because the way the bait moves, and it's going to shoot off the bottom like this, and it's going to rock it back down to the bottom. It's going to shoot off the bottom like this, and then rock it right back down to the bottom. And it's unbelievable how many big walleyes we're catching on shallow weed beds. And I know you guys who have these, like in Devils, there's got a ton of areas like that, that the big expansive flats, big expansive, this is a weed flat that's four to eight foot deep, four to five, you know, to eight, ten foot deep, and we're going up there, moving along really quickly, and it's really fast and erratic uh, presentation. Ah, the next one. This one here is probably the most interesting technique, and it's something we call vertical fishing for suspended fish. I actually won like a bunch of tournaments doing this in Canada. And it's since that time we've experimented with this in very, uh, a lot of other very fishing situations. And what we're doing, this is a moon eye jig, a BMC moon eye jig in a three to four inch smelt plastic. But what's really important about this is how you're fishing the bait and the fish you're fishing for. These particular fish that we're fishing for are fishing for suspended fish. Excuse me, fishing for suspended fish. Let me back that up. In this picture, you see all these uh, this big balls of bait out here, and then you'll see big walleyes here. So many different people, they'll look at that, and they'll see walleyes on their depth finder, and the first thing they do is take their bait, turn around, drop it right down to 25 foot of water, right on the bottom. These fish aren't feeding on, on, on the bottom. These fish are feeding on these guys up here, this rainbow smell. And these uh, shad, these open fish, these bait fish out here, they don't care about what's on the bottom. <laughs> these fish are not looking at they're looking for this, and what you're going to do is take this bait, the same thing, a pretty heavy jig, three to four inch uh, plastic minnow, and you go suspend it right above that guy. 
And what I mean by that, I see them on my electronics, I'm going to drop it straight down, but I'm not going to drop it down to them when I'm suspended three to four feet above his head. Five feet, it's like ice fishing. And you hold the bait like this. I can't tell you how many different fishing situations we have just clubbed walleyes, smallmouth bass, pike, strikers, lake trout using this exact same uh, condition for fishing for suspended fish. Now you're understanding what I'm saying. What we're doing is fishing suspended fish, whatever suspended fish you're fishing. It's the way you're going about doing it, how you're positioning. What we're going to do is move real super slow, and you're going to just sit there and drag it right over the top of them. The thing is, it's sort of interesting. Al Linder has a problem fishing this way because he moves and jigs his bait too much. And the one thing you don't want to do is jig the bait. You take the bait and drop it down, and you say, that's the dumbest thing in the world. Well, I want about 150K doing that in these smallmouth bass in Canada. At the same time, my brother's freaking out, or I'm freaking out. We're fit in the middle of a turn, a big bass turn. It's the third day of bass turn. I catch a 12 pound, 13 pound wall, and Willie's a photographer, my, my brother, and he says he's got to get pictures of this 13 pound wall. I am just firing the thing overboard. I want the next bass. You know what I mean? But the thing is, you wouldn't believe how we, we'd get on spots where all of a sudden you get the wind blowing up onto these points in these Canadian lakes. And it just lights out. I mean, you're just smoking these uh, big wildlife off these deep humps. You get out in these 25 to 35 foot humps where you, you see all those big marks over the top of them. And everybody's dropping live bait bricks. They're dropping it down in jigs and dragging it on the bottom. No, take the bait, put it above them, and move really super slow like this. And it's unbelievable because all of a sudden when they hit it, they come up and they go whoop. You know what I mean? They're coming, they come up and they grab the bait and then they turn around and go down. A lot of times it's really weird because all of a sudden you lose contact with the bait. If you if you can actually fish the bait in some conditions, you can fish the bait almost 10 foot above them. And really, if you're talking like a clear Canadian lake, the fish will travel that far. So I'm going to be moving along a, 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 a ledge here. The top of it's 15. It dumps, dumps out to 30 foot of water. I may only drop my bait 10 foot down. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm going to move this bait that's hovering right here, right along this ledge. Any of the walleyes that are sitting along this ledge, they see that thing coming over there. And you think about it for a second or two. Minnows are not always bolting around like this. They're just sitting there hovering in the water column, and those fish know that that's a real easy meal. Not only that, they're feeding from below up. The fish can't see them. It's a really positive feeding experience or way they can or effectively feed. But that's a, this is a really amazing deal. This is, and I know it'll work in a, a wide variety of different situations. And I do have it uh, 15 to 50 foot of water. Realistically, we've done it in 10 foot of water for smallmouth bass and 8 foot of water. Did the same thing. In 8 foot of water, I had 4 foot of, four foot of line up and I'm holding the bait like this, and you can actually see the fish come up and hit the bait. It's just a kind of, you know what I mean? I'm just trying to open your head up and trying to get, you know what I mean? My biggest point is, is for you guys, it's the willingness to experiment with different ways you go about fishing. The more tools you have in your tackle box, the more effective you are. The more times you experiment with it. This is a bait that, uh, it, how many people have tail dancer in their tackle box? Some number. This is a fabulous, fabulous bait. A lot of people would say, say this is primarily what? This is a trolling lure. Correct? It's an out of or it could be a regular plastic floor. The interesting thing about what this bait is, it's a banana plug, but what it is, it's amazingly snag resilient. We use this for a lot of different river fishing situations when you're fishing through rocks. Because this thing, I can drive through a boulder field and I can take it, and what we do is a lot of times we fish it on a spinning rod in braided line, and we'll throw a short line troll. And you'll take it and throw it like here to the door, not even that far away from it. And I'm in only about six to eight foot of water, and I'm going to be fishing a bait that supposedly goes to 20 foot of water. So, you know what I mean? It would, if I let it go there, it would get that deep. But the thing is, is why I want this bit bigger bait is so I have better control of my bait. Now, I'm moving along a sharp ledge drop or some riprap bank. I can sit there and I don't have to have a big bunch of line up. I have short control on the bait. And, but the biggest thing is the way this bait is, it rolls over rocks with this banana shape. And a lot of other crankbaits where it has a straight bill, what happens is you come in on those rocks and it goes, stoop. There's another seven bucks. <laughs> 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 They're sort of expensive. <laughs> yeah, but the, 
this is a bait that uh, we use a lot in a wide variety of different fishing situations. It's a really uh, highly effective bait that a lot of people do not have in their tackle box. Tackle box. This next system it is something that, uh, it's a, a spinner rig. And what this is, it's a spinner rig, and what we're doing is fishing this, this is a, I'm sorry, the picture is not very clear, so I put it on too light of a background. But what this is, is a one, one eighth ounce to one sixteenth ounce bullet sinker. You have a barrel swivel, and then you have eight to ten inches of line here, a spinner rig with a piece of soft plastic on it, a soft plastic nail. And what we do with this is the same thing. This is a phenomenal technique for trolling, slow trolling over big expanse of weed beds. Or cast it. You can take it, cast this, and reel it in the same thing. This is more or less what the rig is. Right now, I have a little bit short my leader line. I just did this for this picture. But realistically, I have the bullet sinker about here. The interesting thing is, is how this thing goes through weeds and wood. This thing is amazingly snag snagward. So you can take this and drive it right through. I will have weeds coming up to the surface, and I'll take it and just throw it out the back of the boat and move it along really slow speed. So the way this bullet sinker is, and with the spinner, you can drive it right through a weed bed. It's used to the same thing. It's a different technique. Will it work here? I assure you, this in very situations, it will work very, very well. Particularly in weed weed beds is where we've actually done just tremendous with this thing. Actually, I got some buddies that actually fish in Great Lakes, and what they've been doing for like in Sturgeon Bay and up, they get on top of the big deep water pumps, and what they're doing is casting it, letting it uh, take down a little bit, and just slow it in with the tops of those pumps, and they do really well. This is, it's again, it's the same thing. You have to apply this strategy to the waters you fish. Uh, this is a really probably the oldest. Everybody's got a bottom bouncer in this audience, I suspect. I, one of my absolute favorite deep water techniques, bar none, is using an original rapala or a bait called the flat wrap on a bottom bouncer with a, like a three foot fluorocarbon leader. This is in a fabulous deep water river fishing or any type of deep structure fishing technique. Put it on a bait casting rod like this, you drop it directly below the boat, and I'm fishing it really, really close to the boat. I'm fishing the bait, it's right down there. It's right below me, the bottom bouncer and the rig. The rig's this far in back of it, so it's right in back of the boat. So what it enables you to do is I'm following along and I'm moving along a drop off and I'm looking at my step finder. I hit a ridge, I lift up four feet, I cut a hole, I drop it down. In spring, this is unbelievable thing in spring, you get out in the main river channel out here in 25 foot of water, 30 foot of water in those rolling dune areas, you take this and slow troll this in right in the middle of the river channel. This is the same time when everybody's jigging or rigging, you know, dragging jigs or slip drifting jigs, you will catch absolutely the biggest fish in the river. This is, it's a big fish technique. You, you can take an original raffle, a number 11, or if you want to go up in size or a flat wrap is another really good one. You want a bait that's obviously not, that does not, uh, dig too deep. It's just a very, very shallow lip, very, very, very shallow lip. But it, this particular piece, we actually shot this piece on Mille Lacs Lake over, over the mud flats on Mille Lacs, but on rainy lake, on, just on some rainy river in spring. I mean, it's just one of those presentation techniques that you, you've used in so many different situations. It's just one of those things. It's like a bread and butter technique that you use for walleye fishing, and depending on, the, on the, what you're seeing or where the fish are positioned. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. I've got a couple of videotapes and some baits, and I want to go away. But what's the really key to you know success is understanding the nature of fish. You know, it, it really is. And these fish move around. You look at the, the as I was saying, these fish move around in big clouds. And when you put your boat in the water, this you just want to say fish. You know, so many different times people go out and they, they come in. So all the fish weren't biting today. In many different times, you know why they weren't biting? You were fishing. <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> if you weren't fishing where the fish were, you're not going to catch them. The fact of the matter is that a good portion of the water at any given point in time, there are no fish, and those fish move around. And if you're there, it's amazing to me. I actually have this in this next presentation, and, and it shows something. How fast these fish can move when they make their decision to move. And all of a sudden, walleyes are the most uh, volatile.
volatile, they'll move vertically up and down in the water column, they'll move shallow, they'll move deep, really quick, probably faster than almost all of our uh, warm water species of fish. They do. That's just the nature of the fish themselves. They're not afraid to get up on, you know, to be out in 20 foot of water, 25 foot of water, and get up onto a five or eight foot rock. <laughs> the wind starts blowing in, all of a sudden those fish are right up sitting on the, on the rock pile. All of a sudden it lays flat, they sit there for a little bit, and then all of a sudden they're out here. They move around a lot, they do. But once you get isolated in the area where those fish are at, that's the really key to be able to land on one of the clouds or these schools of fish and where they're at. And the, you guys are fishing rivers. The interesting thing is river fishermen, to me, are probably some of the best anglers I know. The reason is because they're used to changing conditions and they're used to always adjusting. If the fish are active, they're fishing, they know that the fish are up in the real front end of the current where it's real fast. If the fish are inactive, they're back here, they're downstream in the edge, a little bit more inactive down here. Water clarity change. They change, you know what I mean? Well, river fishermen as a whole, whether it be walleye fishermen, bass river fishermen, are actually generally better fishermen because why? Is because they're used to 